Your Excellency, uh, Rusi office holders, vice, fellow vice patrons, industry leaders, ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon about the Forces Command contribution to resilience. I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for the warm invitation to be able to speak this afternoon and share uh, the Forces Command perspective on how Army is improving our national resilience. I'd also extend a warm welcome to those uh, watching via live stream being hosted by The Cove, which is our professional development uh, application for Army based here out of Victoria Barracks in Sydney. Um, I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I also pay my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have contributed to the defence of Australia in times of peace and war. Forces Command with our headquarters here in Sydney and units all across Australia uh, effectively comprises about 80% of Army, including all of the brigades and training centres. Uh, Forces Command is charged to raise, train and sustain our Army for being uh, peace and wartime activities as part of a joint force. In addressing the topic of how Forces Command is contributing to improving national resilience, I'd first like to speak about the changing nature of war and uh, an increased call for ADF assistance to national crises. I'll then talk about how Forces Command is creating mutually beneficial strategic partnerships with our communities and the region to give our people the social skills needed to enable the joint force in peace and war. The Fleet Commander has already described how the region is becoming increasingly complex, dynamic and contested, and our Army has always adapted to new challenges and shown resilience but we're now experiencing the change in the character of war at a much faster and faster rate. From an army point of view, we call this accelerated warfare. In addition to these changes, in addition to these changes in our international environment, our government is increasingly turning to the ADF to uh, support the nation in times of crisis. In the past few years, the ADF has repeatedly been called upon to assist state authorities and emergency services in floods, fires, cyclones, and most recently, national uh, health pandemic. As extreme weather events and natural disasters are becoming increasingly frequent, the higher impact on our Australian community, it's likely the government will increasingly call upon the ADF to contribute to domestic and emergency response. Operating in challenging environments and needing to adapt to new ways is not new for our Defence Force. We've been doing it throughout our history, but the combination of accelerated warfare and an increased requirement from the government to, for the ADF to support in times of national crisis has resulted in increased uncertainty for what the ADF needs to be ready for, and we expect this uncertainty to continue. For Army to succeed in this uncertainty, we need land forces that are prepared to respond to demanding and uncertain environments. Forces that are able to adapt quickly, to partner with not only the other services, but other government agencies and other militaries, and with capacity to take on an increasingly wider range of roles and tasks. These tasks could range from something as benign as COVID, uh, COVID contact tracing all the way up to complex war fighting against an adversary that has similar technologies and capability. As, to distinct, as distinct from the overmatch that we've enjoyed in recent uh, conflicts. Being prepared to meet a range of tasks demanded in multiple contexts is what Army calls Army emotion and relies upon individuals building their individual and organisational resilience. Outside of wartime, we've perhaps never adapted as quickly as what we have over the past two years. COVID has shown the resilience of our army and indeed our three services. Like every other workplace, COVID has restricted um, our people's movement and tested their ability to get together to train in traditional ways. We've found ways to adapt our training, our operations and our routines to ensure continuity of our practices and maintain our readiness. Some ways COVID, in some ways, COVID has forced us to rethink how we conduct our training and to find efficiencies in our approach. 
We've seen that in the response to restricted border travel where army units located literally in every corner of the country have adapted their training methodology to decentralise training and where appropriate, conduct training in an online sense. I'm proud of what Forces Command and indeed the broader army have been able to achieve in this way while continuing to contribute to national response to, uh, to state and with state and emergency services to the COVID crisis. In this way, we've been able to maintain preparedness also for not only COVID, but for other contingencies. While Army harnesses and coordinates effects across all domains, including space and cyber, to secure the national interests and ensure sovereignty and human security, history shows at some point it's always necessary to put boots on the ground. Army is fundamentally a people-centric organisation and our people are for us our competitive advantage. We rely on their professional character. We rely on their uh, ethical and moral decision-making and to remain accountable in order to maintain the trust that we, uh, that we currently enjoy with the community and with our country. This trust, this trust allows greater asset, our greatest asset, our people, to operate in and amongst the communities, to support, to secure, to influence, and if required, engage in combat um, amongst the population. This professional character is the essence of what we call good soldiering. Good soldiering enables Army to quickly form teams whenever, wherever and with whomever is needed to succeed. We can develop many of the moral and intellectual attributes required of our people within Army through our focused training efforts, education and experiences. However, these attributes encompass the development of character, leadership, communication, cognitive and interpersonal skills. That These can be further developed by enhanced uh, learning in other contexts, working with other partners. This is why strong partnerships are essential to build our capacity and resilience as an organisation. These partnerships span across local communities, our allies, regional partners, other government agencies, industry and academia. Army's partnerships expose our people to a variety of contexts to improve our ability to enhance the moral and intellectual capability of our people. Our Army's partnerships are the basis of our capacity, our strategic depth, our domestic security and support to national resilience. I'll now speak of some of the work across communities, across the region and our strategic partners that Army is undertaking. While there is uh, always a focus on developing our hard edge warfighting capability, You'll see why exposing to our people to these other contexts helps our people to develop their soft skills, which is uh, what's required to be able to operate in and amongst communities. And how learning from and integrating uh, experiences gained from these environments ultimately helps to improve our performance and resilience. Army's people are from the community and they return to the community at the end of their period of service. We value that connection with the, with the nation and encourage our people to live, be active and give back to the communities whenever possible. Our engagement is multifaceted and multi uh, also multi-beneficial, enabling Army to serve local communities while also developing our people's social skills through working with partners and supporting civilian populations in crisis. Despite a very restricted ability to engage with the communities in the past 12 months, Forces Command alone has engaged and supported in 247 different community activities across Australia. These engagements, of these engagements, 62% were with youth groups, including Indigenous groups, cadets, sporting activities and school visits. Another 26% of engagement was with veterans groups charities and family open days, and the remainder were displays and ceremonial support. Not only do these activities develop social skills, relationships and empathy in our people, but they also support whole of government welfare and development programs to assist elements of our community to thrive. Supporting and giving back to our local communities is a staple for Army and something that will continue into the future. 
The, Aborigin the Army Aboriginal Community Assistance Program, or ACAP, began in 1997. ACAP programs and, uh, and the a ACAP project is a wonderful opportunity for our engineer trades to work with remote Aboriginal communities to construct housing, roads, sewerage facilities, airfields, telecommunications infrastructure, school facilities, potable water, the list goes on. In the last decade, this involvement has extended to coordination of health and veterinary training and the delivery of employable skills programs for those remote communities. ACAP reinforces the strong association between Army and Indigenous peoples of Northern and Central Australia. To ensure we're connected with and understand our region, each of our brigades across Army and across Forces Command also have a habitual relationship with several of our smaller regional partners to focus on cultural understanding and to build enduring relationships. Regular exercises with these partners and others, including New Zealand, Singapore, Philippines, Malaysia and Indonesia, enable our Army to train, support national engagement objectives and to contribute to nation building. We also know our future joint operations will comprise of coalition, uh, coalition force operations and interagency uh, engagements with numerous stakeholders. Therefore, we're also focusing our attention on engagements with major powers. Of course, uh, the US, UK, Japan, India, Canada, and the Republic of Korea. Additionally, we're increasing our interoperability with Australian organisations, including other government and civilian agencies such as DFAT, State Emergency Services, Academia, and Industry, all of whom are potential stakeholders in conceivable future operations. Operating in this wide variety of, with this wide variety of partners and varied environments is preparing us for those boots on the ground uh, roles that I described earlier, which I'll illustrate by sharing a recent story from a Townsville infantry soldier, Corporal Quinn Jensen. Corporal Jensen was part of the joint and interagency team that recently deployed at very short notice to Kabul airport as part of the evacuation assistance for Australian passport holders and visa holders uh, out of Afghanistan just a few short weeks ago. In the year leading up to this deployment, Corporal Jensen, as part of his team, conducted the full cycle of warlike training activities culminating, culminating in the joint international exercise Talisman Sabre. While that warlike training certified Corporal Jensen and his team to be ready to deploy that year, uh, they also supported Operation COVID Assist tasks in Western Australia. They were involved in charity work with Legacy and Ronald McDonald House in Townsville and were also part of the local Townsville Proud Warrior campaign or Proud Warrior program for Indigenous and at-risk youth. When Corporal Jensen's team arrived on the ground in Kabul, they found themselves in confronting conditions. The Kabul airport had three entry gates geographically dispersed by about eight kilometres each congested with thousands of desperate people hoping to get out. The troops on the ground had to quickly assess the environment, develop a plan and execute their mission. It was arduous, dynamic and austere. They were operating for eight days with very little rest or sleep as part of a multinational interagency team. For a 12 hour period during that operation, Corporal Jensen found himself single-handedly identifying and securing members and families from the vulnerable Afghanistan women's soccer team, which consisted of approximately 20 family groups. He found a local English speaker who would translate and help him identify the team and their families as he worked his way through the crowd, trying to pick them out and bring them through security to safety. He retrieved the soccer team from the press of the crowd and negotiated with various authorities for their safe passage to Australia and did so successfully. Those women and their families are now safe here in Australia. The capacity to negotiate difficult human terrain, often under conditions of heightened stress from environmental and other threat factors, was critical to the success of that Afghanistan evacuation operation. Australian soldiers must have skills to communicate in socially um, acceptable ways 
develop understanding and foster empathy between people. Every soldier who read the nonverbal cues, every soldier who can read nonverbal cues, anticipate changes in atmospherics and find all way, alternate ways to communicate adds significant value to achievement of the mission. Corporal Jensen hi highlights the criticality of land combatants um, developing soft skills that bridge the cultural and language barriers that often exist to gain access to parts of the population or groups that need our support. We know that in an era of accelerated warfare, our army must evolve to be more adaptable and ready to meet a greater range of roles and tasks that, all go that the uh, government will require of us. Forces Command contributes to the building of national resilience through investing in our most important asset, our people, to develop them and the moral and intellectual attributes that they have to make army more operationally relevant and competent, both nationally and internationally. We're doing this through win-win partnerships with the broadest range and broadest array of organisations and groups that we can muster. We know that we need to continue to evolve, but we'll look to our organisational response to COVID-19 and individuals like Corporal Jensen um, to demonstrate that our army is already well on the way to achieving the resilience required from our army to be future ready. Thanks very much. <laughs>